got a lot of success stories here and hopefully um, Ivory Organics is gonna add even more success stories. It's a pictures. rescue mission right here. Yeah, yeah, it's a rescue mission. Three, two, one, sink. Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics where we grow cool plants and today we're here with Cameron Akrami of the Busy Gardener and he got my attention um, in just the last few months and I'm so glad he's here visiting with us as he has mastered his understanding of whitewashing for well over a decade whereas Ivory Organics says YouTube channel was founded in 2015 sharing um, some demonstrations with you in 2016 and this guy here has been doing it for over 10 years on his property as you're going to see with all these different fruit trees in his urban forest and we're surrounded by I'd say at least 50 to 100 fruit trees yeah I think like 60 at last count and out of curiosity, what motivated you? Where did you get that inspiration or, under, or the understanding of whitewashing your fruit trees? Well, this all started when I planted a few trees in my front yard. Uh, I was watching these Dave Wilson nursery videos with Tom Spellman and Tom's like resident expert on YouTube, um, or at least in terms of fruit trees, he's helped sell millions and millions of trees. Yes. And, and his instructional stuff, he talked about the importance of whitewashing trees. And so he's really the one that got me turned on to the idea in terms of protecting him by doing that. That's awesome. Tom Spellman is the master and the authority on especially bare root fruit trees throughout the country. I yeah. think the Dave Wilson Nursery is the number one distributor of bare root fruit trees in the country. And Tom Spellman is the spokesperson. And how fantastic it is, is it that Cameron lives just a mile away from Tom Spellman's home? I've seen him driving on the street before. It's so funny to just say, oh, there goes Tom again. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about location. And before we tour all of these fruit trees that are thriving so beautifully well, your climate here is quite, quite unique. We're in the city of Rancho Cucamonga and your summers are quite hot. How hot? Well, we set a record this last year. I think we a couple of days of 115 degrees in the summer. So we're easily at 100 degrees on a bunch of days during the summer, usually in the high 90s, but we get pretty warm. We're kind of a little bit desertish out here. So you can have, I'm guessing, several weeks with over 100 degrees. Yeah, we could. I know last year we had that record spell that affected all of Southern California. You said it was 115 yeah. for two consecutive days. Um, and that affected avocados. It affected a lot of food um, throughout Southern California when we had that record extreme heat. Um, but it's consistently over 100 degrees for weeks at, on end during the summer here. And then you got winters that are how cold? We get down into the low 30s. Thankfully, we don't dip too low below. I've, I have not seen it go below 30, but it gets it gets really cold compared to a San Diego that gets, you know, low of 50 or whatever it is. We get pretty cold. So it can dip just a couple of degrees below freezing, but not much more than that. Yeah, thankfully. So and we're talking about when I say winter, winter, nighttime, low temperatures, not the daytime afternoon high that right. might bounce back quickly in the morning back into the 50s or 60s. Yeah. Okay. With that being said, let's do the tour. My favorite tree, um, just by the look of it, is this magnificent reddish um, purple looking tree. What is it? This is a Spice Z Nectar Plum. It's a nectarine plum hybrid that favors the nectarine. So aside from being so dramatic, I've never tasted it, but you said it's also... Oh, it's sweet, like sugar. It's insane. So I, an amazing addition to the um, food forest. I think everyone should seriously consider it. Um, and let's um, take a look within the tree. And again, I told you that Cameron understood the value of whitewashing, but you can see that that tree trunk has been painted and he's been continuously maintaining the health of the plant by whitewashing periodically. I'm guessing how, how often do you? Um... Probably every couple of years. When I first plant, um, I whitewashed all of these and then I think I've come through maybe, these are in the ground four years. Okay. So I've come through twice total whitewash and probably do for another one I see some space on the bark there yeah as it continues to grow you reapply um, the whitewash and again being those concept you learned from Tom Spellman there's actually an educational lesson with Tom Spellman a couple years ago I attended a lecture where he said that from the time you pick up a fruit tree from the nursery yes doesn't the, the bark in the tree uh, get burned by the sun when it doesn't have so many leaves the, there's definitely the potential for sunburn. That's why we talked about whitewash earlier. So if I was gonna plant this tree today, the first thing I would do is whitewash any of the structure that faced that south-southwest. 
And if you're aggressively pruning a tree to an open center style, you want to protect all that growth or all that, that bark that's exposed to the southwest. So sunburn in Southern California is a must. If you're not sunburn protecting your trees, you could definitely be losing trees or have trees that are that are weak uh, in response to that sun. Absolutely, absolutely, especially subtropical material, especially avocados. Avocados absolutely have to do that. Sure, yeah. So, you know, whitewash should be part of your basic maintenance routine for any type of fruiting material. Uh, just something that, you know, and all you want to do is get a light coat of protection on there. I just want a nice light coat on there that's going to protect against sun damage for that first season. And you can, you can have sun damage in a matter of a couple of days. If I took an avocado that's, you know, say uh, uh, Laverne Nursery growing avocados can tight in north-south rows, those trees are, each row is shading the next row, each tree is shading the next tree. So all of a sudden that tree gets pulled out of the nursery row and sent to a, a retail nursery and picked up. And now I take it out and set it out in the middle of a yard where it gets 100% sun exposure. Well, now you've opened that tree up to damage immediately. So the day you plant a tree should be the day you whitewash that tree. You can get damage in a very short period of time. Yeah. Last year I was able to talk to Charles about his product that he has out here that's the whitewash. Exactly. Thing, and that's yeah. a great application where I had really great success. I hadn't been doing it enough and having a chance to talk with him and get a, uh, his product really worked well on my tree. So. I, 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 I trialed this product yeah. um, after, actually after this meeting last year. Yeah, it worked very well. It was a good, good quality. Talk to him afterwards. Yeah, so those of you that are concerned with whitewash, there's your man to see. Yes. Where it was in a group its entire life from the time it was created and grafted and even at the nursery, it's always surrounded by those other fruit trees. When you bring it to the home garden, if we can just take a couple of steps back, you can see, for example, this, I'm assuming um, apple. Yeah, Honeycrisp apple. So we got a Honeycrisp apple tree over here. You can see again, also it's been whitewashed, but now it's standing alone all by itself in the middle of your food forest. And that tree trunk is exposed to, here we are not going in the summer, 14 hours of daylight. And if our skin is out in the sun 14 hours a day, we're gonna spend more time cooking and less time you know, working on our health. And so by whitewashing it, now the plant can focus more on growth and creating that canopy and ultimately flowering and fruiting um, and giving many more years of, of life and health to not just itself, but hopefully your family as well. Yeah, kind of, especially on a young tree because it doesn't have the same canopy that's gonna help to protect all of these inner branches and structure. I mean, each of these inner branches are gonna be what I rely on to be strong and healthy and support a fruit set later. So keeping them protected now is gonna set me up for strong fruit five years from now as these really thicken out and end up being the main structure of our tree. That's great. Well. On the theme of the spicy nectar plum, nectar right? Plum, yeah. So you've also got other related plants next to it. What's this over here with the red fruit? Yeah, this is an Arctic. This is the Arctic star nectarine. So check out all of these fruit over here. Look at the beautiful colors. It's totally loaded. Yeah, this branch is about to break. Maybe consider supporting it soon. Yep. Um, and. Tell us a little bit about, and I know this is another Tom Spellman um, lesson. Man, we're pitching him heavily here um, right now. But what is this concept where you've kind of grouped, because as we continue the tour throughout his um, urban food forest, you'll notice that there's a theme within all the different um, parts of your backyard. Um, explain what it, what is this concept that you've done? Yeah, so this is essentially called like a backyard orchard culture is what they call it. And the idea is that rather than in the space of where you've got one tree, normally you'd have one, traditionally you'd have one gigantic tree, maybe a plum tree or something. And that plum tree, when it is ready, is gonna have 900 plums. Yeah. And those plums are all gonna be ready within a single week. And then they're all gonna fall on the ground. Correct. Um, or you're gonna go pick them. The idea here is that in the space of a single tree, we're able to plant two or three or four trees that have successive ripening. Um, and they're kept smaller so that way rather than having one plum tree that's giving me 900 plums at once Makes sense. I've got, you know, it's gonna this one tree will give me maybe like this next tree and will give me 150 fruit for these couple of weeks and then a month later one of the other ones in the group are gonna give me another 150 fruit So that makes sense. the idea is that they don't all ripen at one time you get some variety So more dense planting. Yes, you're looking for successive ripening So yeah. try to find varieties that ripen in different months like for example um, May, 
June, July, August, and now you can enjoy four months of fruit. This is probably the largest tree, by the way, that we he has in his um, food forest as we continue the tour. And he's kept pretty much all the fruit, you can see, within arm's reach. I can reach the, the very top of the tree. Even, the, if, even if these fruit, I'm gonna be able to bend it down and pick the fruit off. Well, the fruit is all on last year's growth. Right. So all the flowers happen in a range where he pruned it within reach. This is all the new growth for this year. There's no fruit on the new growth. If he allows it to continue growing and he doesn't prune it back by next winter and before the next flowering season, next spring, then he's gonna be able to keep the fruit all within a manageable reach. And this is um, a valuable lesson for those trying to just benefit. I'm gonna have you um, repeat the words. Um, what is the concept again of having um, the success of ripening? Oh, so this whole concept is a backyard orchard culture. Backyard orchard culture. So I think um, the way to sum it up is that the backyard grower like me or like you yeah. is diff has different aims or goals than the commercial grower who's going to plant 900 of something. They want the trees to get as big as they can yep. and they want all the fruit to be harvested at one time so that the way they can go through one time with the tractor. But I don't want all that as and, a and the goal is also on the same concept is that each tree is supposed to reach maximum um, just fruit production, yeah. maximum yields. And so they're spaced accordingly and, and, and pruned for maximum fruit yields. Yes. That's not the goal here. No, no. We, we want fruit that we're going to be able to come out and pick regularly yeah. um, over a growing season, um, a few months. Yep. And also, again, no, we're not coming out here with tractors. I don't want to bring a ladder out here. So the idea is that I can just, whatever I can reach is what I can pick and that's where I keep it pruned to. That's fantastic. Well, let's continue the tour to another part of your garden. Cool. Okay. Um, what do you so here we are now in the apple orchard and here we have three varieties of apples planted close to one another with that method again known as the, I gotta say it, man. Do I, it, do it. Backyard orchard culture. Yes. Um, and that method known as the backyard orchard culture, again, you can see that they've been densely planted closely to one another and um, explain the varieties to us. Yeah, well, we have that success of ripening. So here, the first that's going to go and that's already ready here is this Dorset Golden Apple. You gotta check these out. Yeah, we're at the beginning of June and these are gonna be ready within a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, here we have a Fuji apple. And there's some apples um, I can see within the canopy. Yeah, yeah. So we got Fuji, Fuji. and then what's over here? And this right? is Granny Smith. Wonderful. And Granny Smith is a few months out. This is probably going to be ready at the very end of summer. Early I know fall. mine are close to like November yeah. on, on my property. So you've got these three varieties of apples all spaced months apart ripening, yeah. um, successive ripening wise. And um, one of the things, and again, we're talking about whitewashing. I want to kind of emphasize because Cameron again understood this concept well over 10 years ago. You can see all of the tree trunks have been whitewashed. But you may need to come a little bit in towards the center of this canopy here and you'll see over in this area that there's some girdling happening to the tree and it looks like maybe some animal chewed here on the bark you can see that it was protected there's no protection in this area and if you come in a little closer you might even see some tunneling from either possibly some beetles or termites that have come in at this point and if we come up a little higher in the structure you can see again there's some more girdling damage that's happening up in this canopy so these are all areas that afterwards we're going to come through and whitewash and offer protection with the ivory organic 3-in-1 plant guard that has these seven essential oils that will serve as a repellent keeping beetles and termites from potentially entering this is now exposed wood um, and causing further damage to the um, structural support of the tree well let's continue now to another part of the food forest well now let's enter your um plum yeah. Right? Family trees. Yeah, plum family is a good way to say it. Uh, every, we're going to start here with these that are called pluaries. And pluaries are essentially a plum cherry hybrid. People think those are two very different fruit, but yeah. they're all part of the same prunus family. And so they're all, they all can generally uh, pollinate each other yep. and get some sort of unique fruit. So, yeah, we have a sweet treat pluary, candy heart pluary. You got to come a little closer to these fruits because they're actually shaped as a teardrop heart on these fruits. So it's a, again, plum and cherry is the combination of, of, of this particular fruit. Um, and let's continue. Yeah, so this beauty, this giant beauty over here is a Santa Rosa plum. It's the most vigorous tree in this entire orchard. Mm -hmm. Look at the trunk is just five times the size of every other trunk in this entire place. Very strong, very well established. And I'm guessing 
two, three, four hundred fruit on this tree. Easily. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully you're gonna capture the fruit as we continue the tour. Okay, so, we got this little baby over here. Yeah, the little baby that hasn't actually been whitewashed. Okay. Shame on me. Well, we're gonna do that next. There you go. <laughs> and so this is a uh, emerald drop pluot. So a pluot is a plum apricot hybrid that uh, is really tasty and ends up retaining a green fruit. Even when it's ripe, it's gonna be green. That's wonderful. And then yep. the one behind you is loaded with fruit. Yeah, here. this is a champion. I, if somebody's gonna plant a pluot, I think, uh, especially for a backyard, this is flavor grenade pluot. And the reason I like flavor grenade is one, it tastes exceptional. Um, and the other is that the fruit hangs on here for six weeks. Oh, that's phenomenal. So if you're wanting to come out and just pick fruit periodically, and not yeah. all at one time, this is a wonderful cultivar to have. So most of the stone fruit, and it's again, another um, Dave Wilson, Tom Spellman um, educational lesson is um, that typically the stone fruits ripen in a very short period of time. Yeah. It could one be one week, week, two weeks. You're seeing this one here can hold on for up to six weeks. Yeah. And that's very valuable so that if you've got a ton of fruit, as you've got in this case, you can enjoy them over a greater period of time instead of just being completely in a day with just too much in too short a period of time and a lot of it goes to waste. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And you're able to eat it fresh as opposed to having to do that really labor intensive stuff like canning and stuff. Jamming and freezing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And over here. This is a this is a new tree in our orchard here. Uh, this is a cotton candy aprium. So it's kind of a it's a related to those, but this favors the apricot. So it's apricot plum hybrid. So the aprium is apri for apricot, yeah. um for the plums. So yeah. aprium, cotton candy. Check out the foliage of the new growth. It kind of does look cotton candy-ish as well. Look at the color. It's quite unique compared to the apricot with the reddish new foliage that eventually then turns green. And then we've got what looks to be an apricot, but is not. What is this? This is probably the weirdest named one in the entire thing, and it's called a picotum. And this has peach, apricot, plum parentage. And so... That's amazing. The fruit in practice has ended up being more of an apricot than the others, but it's it's really a unique piece of fruit. Again, so it's peach, plum, and apricot. Yeah. All in one. And all of these fruits that we kind of just visited all came from, who was the inventor of, of like this concept of blending fruits together? Yeah, so Floyd Zeiger, or okay. Zeiger. Um, so, I figured we'll give him credit for yeah. you know creating all of these amazing flavors. He's been doing it since like the 1940s or something. He's in his 90s now. Wow. Really incredible stuff. So something also important to know is that none of these are like genetically modified. That's very important. All they're doing is speeding up what would naturally happen in nature with cross pollinating. That's an important lesson. So even though we talked about apricot plums being like mixed, yeah. we're not doing <laughs> GMO as a, you know, or, or genetically modifying the genes as would happen, for example, by taking the genetics of a bug yeah. and, and infusing it, you know, with the genetics of a plant, which is what they're doing with some sciences, um, just mixing things that would never otherwise mix. These are basically an accelerated hybridization, which is basically a cross pollination between what would otherwise happen naturally in nature. It's just on, um, under control scientific conditions. Yeah. Um, and that's how we're creating such amazing flavors and, and quality fruit trees. And again, I'm just taken away by that um, first tree that we visited. Being yeah, the, the nectar plum. The nectar plum and reddish um, purple foliage and fruit. Yeah. It's quite spectacular. So I found a tree here that's not doing quite so well in yeah. the busy gardener urban garden. Yeah. Um, what is this over here? It's a Haas avocado. Are you sure it's a Haas and not a Haas? According to Mr. Haas, is it's a Haas avocado. It's a Haas avocado. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hard to get over that when you've heard Haas for your whole life. Same here. Yeah. Yeah, this has been really struggling. Um, ever since I put it in, we think we may have some uh, drainage issues in this area, which have not helped, but I've planted it above grade, and, I, and just looking at it, I think the sun's beat up on it quite yeah. a bit, too. Um, on the positive, and when it does come to avocados, it's important to um, try to keep at least the top one, two inches of the root ball, sometimes above grade. And as you can see here with Cameron, he's got a nice layer of wood chips, which helps in so many beneficial ways. In the summer, it helps keep the soil cooler. In the winter, it's offering insulation, keeping the soil warmer. Um, and also as these wood chips break down, it's feeding the under soil biology, which includes the earthworms, beneficial bacteria, the beneficial mycorrhizal fungal, um, hypha that's creating this network, not just between this tree, but all the other fruit trees within the garden. But there is a stress happening. And 
Um, we're going to talk again about the value of whitewashing, which you've already discovered, yeah. but for whatever reason, you didn't do this one tree. And take a look at what I call third degree sunburns. And when you come in, I can tell you from now that this is the south side of the plant, which is the side that's getting the most sun. So the sun's rising up in the sky. It's never directly over the plant. Mm -hmm. Being in the northern hemisphere as we are here in, you know, United States, but anything in the northern hemisphere, it's the south side of your plant that's gonna get the most sun. And you can see that on this side, we're seeing all of this brown tissue. And this is not just, you know, from age and getting um, developed, because when we go to the other side, you're gonna see that it's quite green. As you come down, you can see all this cracking happening. A little further down, this branch has given up and died going out, which we're gonna be pruning soon. And again, more cracks. The cracks are not just on the surface. We're talking about even the underlying cambium tissues are drying out and burning, resulting in the stresses and the struggle for this plant to even stay alive on its ends. So we're gonna be whitewashing and offering this tree now protection or clothe from the weather extremes of the hottest days of summer, as well as in the winter, it offers the plant also insulation from the coldest nighttime low temperatures as well, from what they call winter sun scald. And if we come around back, I just want to share with you now, if we reverse this, now we're on the north side of the plant. And I don't even know which way, I'm, I'm not even asking or even pulling out a yeah. compass, but I can tell you north is this way because this side of the plant is not burnt. It's yeah, still yeah. all it's still all green. True north right there. So um, Cameron is confirming that I've got my geography right just by looking at the tree. You can see that this side is all green relative to the other side that's all crispy brown um, and, and, and charred. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna begin whitewashing. So now um, here we are. One other thing I wanna share with you, if you take a look here at the tree trunk, we're talking about, again, the underlying wood is exposed as well. It's burned so badly that the bark's even starting to peel off in a couple of places along the tree trunk. And now we're gonna protect it using the um, Ivory Organics 3-in-1 plant guard. And it's Omri listed here for use in organic agriculture. And you can see it protects the plants from summer sunburn, insects, and rodents. And it's for use under roses, fruit nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. Pretty much versatile for all plants to basically curb weather extremes and um, and offer that insect and rodent um, protection as well. So if you ever see any girdling happening around your plant, which is a big phenomenon up in the Bay Area, where apparently rats are chewing on trees year round, this will offer protection to basically keep rodents from girdling your tree. The first thing we're gonna do here is I noticed that you've got a branch here that is dead, completely dead. It's dried all the way back from the tips down to the tree trunk. And when it comes to pruning dead branches, you don't have to wait for winter time to be pruning. It's something you can do year round. So I'm gonna have you, being at your tree, have the honors of... <laughs> what do they say? This hurts me more than it hurts you. It's actually helpful to the plant so that it's not wasting any of its resources attempted to go into directions that are otherwise dead. Now it can put its water and other mineral resources to now benefiting the other more healthier parts of the plant. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go with the um, 3-in-1 plant guard here and, and let's prepare the product. So here we are now, um, since you've got the apron on, <laughs> not that it's necessary, but it looks good. Yeah, but if once I start going like this, you know, you know. can't stop me, the art happens. Splitter splatter. <laughs> um, so we're basically gonna take the organic base powder. I'm gonna read the ingredients while you open that up. It includes iron oxide, which controls the color. This one here is white, but it's also available in colors brown and green. So you can do things that are maybe more um, in line with whatever the aesthetics are, instead of just having a white looking tree. Um, and then it also includes limestone, mica, milk, silica, methyl cellulose, diatomaceous earth. Um, the value of the diatomaceous earth is also another insect yep. um, repellent property that's in there. Um, limestone and mica were the way it was done traditionally, like thousands of years ago before paint. And talking about paint, I just want to say, if you paint your house 100 years later, there's still paint on your house. But if you put paint on your trees, within one to two, three years, as you already said, like every two years, you got to repaint your plants. But all that paint you put on your trees is now in your soil, and it's going to take a long time for that to break up. Yep. So that's the reason um, for doing the whitewashing gardening concept that was known thousands of years ago, but doing it in an organic way. So I'll have you add the um, powder to the can. And while you do that, I'm just gonna share. There's also the whitewashing concept can also be done in a ready to use spray. That can and the directions on the back, we can actually spin it real quick. I can share with you that the foliar spray, this one pint makes up to five gallons of this ready to use spray. And you can also make your own spray bottles by simply taking 
one half to one third of a teaspoon of the powder to a spray bottle such as this. This is 23 ounces. And this here is to get like the leaves and the harder to brush on um, areas of the plant. You can just now do a total plant whitewashing protection. Um, before you add the oil, I always like to add water next. And I'll add water about halfway. And you can now add the oils or I'm just gonna start mixing. Wow. How does that smell? Yeah, it smells really nice. <laughs> It smells like a diffuser inside my house sometimes. I always say it smells like an Italian kitchen. Yeah. Again, the, the oils that are in there, um, aside from castor, which is not the most pleasant smelling, but the rest of them are amazing. Cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint. Yes. So you got all of those good things Smell the mint and the rosemary. But yep. all of those plants are naturally insect repelling plants as well as um, rodent um, you know, repelling plants as well. So all of that's going in there. And now we can start mixing it. And if you've got less water, it'll have more of a paste consistency when you apply it. But the goal when applying it is to have something the consistency of about a 50% latex paint. So this is gonna go, go on quite watery and this is gonna allow you to extend the product over a lot of trees here in your garden, not just this one. So now let's get to whitewashing and protecting your Hass avocado tree. So it's important to protect the tree trunk and also all of the primary branches coming off the tree trunk because those are the branches that are gonna support your, hopefully many decades of fruit production. And we wanna make sure that that heart is protected and not suffering with these, unfortunately, third degree burns that are happening here. But even if it's a first degree burn or even not a noticeable burn, we just don't want that plant investing resources towards sunburn in the summer, sun scald in the winter, or just dealing with any pest issues. If we can protect the heart of the plant, it's just gonna produce that many more years and decades of success for itself and hopefully for your family and friends to enjoy as well. Especially avocados. Avocados are one of the most sensitive of fruit trees when it comes to um, summer sunburn especially. And another one that's in you know up there is citrus trees, but all fruit trees, all plants in general, even roses, figs, and so forth are all susceptible to getting burned, especially when it's got an open canopy, a very young canopy. Um, and until it creates that much larger canopy that naturally shades the understory of the plant, you're gonna need to consistently whitewash your tree from year to year. And the cool thing is once we do this, just as with your other trees, your plant's gonna be protected for a, you know, a solid year, possibly even two years from the elements. I'm really focusing on this, these little areas where they have these third degree burns and these holes where he's getting in through the, through the trunk, through the bark. So you can see here, we've probably used about a quarter inch, maybe um, half an inch of the product so far on this, probably five, six foot tall avocado tree. We've got a lot of product to now paint on all of these other unprotected whitewashed um, fruit trees here in your garden. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take the ready to use spray. And like I said, you can take about a third to a half of a teaspoon of that powder and recreate your own spray bottles. But I've got this on hand and now we can spray the leaves and all of those stems that would otherwise be too difficult to get your brush in. And you can see now we've got some sunscreen protection now on the leaves as well. And we can do that through the entire canopy of the tree as well. And this is gonna offer protection. Here we are now in June. Once it's on the leaves, again, we know that the brush on protection is gonna be good for about a year. The leaves, it'll offer protection for about nine months. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna take you well into summer and fall, and you won't even have to reconsider doing this unless there's any new growth that you wanna protect during any weather extremes as well. So I had a lot of fun here at the Busy Gardener. Yeah. You've got a lot of success stories here, and hopefully um, Ivory Organics is gonna add even more success stories. It's a creatures. rescue mission right here. Yeah, yeah. it's a rescue mission. Um, thanks for sharing this wonderful opportunity with me and also all of our subscribers here at the Ivory Organics YouTube channel. For those of you um, that have not already subscribed, be sure to subscribe and hit that push bell notification in addition to, don't forget to go to The Busy Gardener with Cameron he has been, and I don't think we started off with this, but I'm gonna share, 
He's been on YouTube since 2006, and he's got a ton of valuable lessons there. You've been bringing content and sharing your beautiful urban garden um, with those viewers, and to get a lot of great advice and helpful hip, tips, and to continue seeing the growth and the success stories happening here at the garden, be sure to visit again the Busy Gardener. Like, subscribe, and also hit that push bell notification because subscribing is not enough to get the notification of those videos as soon as they become released. As always, keep growing with Ivory Organics. And how do you conclude? Hey, I like this on my channel saying whether you've got one tree in your orchard or 500. Until next time, stay busy. Stay busy. Happy gardening. <laughs>